Good afternoon. I know that we're on a tight schedule. Many of you have flights to catch uh, right after this, so I'd like to start on time. Um, and I'd also like to encourage those that are sitting in the back, if it's at all possible to move closer to the front, uh, we'd greatly appreciate that. So this afternoon, in this closing session, um, we have the distinct pleasure of uh, having Dr. Francis Collins with us. Um, I wanted to give a short note on a personal scale here. Um, about eight years ago, I was doing my clinical cytogenetic fellowship training in Boston, and I happened to see a patient come in to genetics clinic. Um, this patient was uh, referred to genetics clinic because uh, he had actually been seen 18 years previous uh, at, uh, by another uh, genetics clinic. The patient had extra chromosomal material on the short arm of his Y chromosome. This material was G-band light negative. And the t unfortunately, the technology wasn't available at that time to elucidate the origin of that extra chromosome material. And a clinical geneticist had uh, spent some time counseling that patient, advising that patient that to come back in a few years because the technology will soon be available to get more information on that genetic aberration. That clinical geneticist was Dr. Francis Collins when he was at the University of Michigan. And of course, Dr. Collins was correct. Uh, we were able to give more information to the patient, and in fact, it turns out that the patient's extra chromosomal material was distal uh, material on chromosome 22. This is just one example of how Dr. Collins has touched the lives of uh, patients and fellow colleagues uh, that are practicing clinical genetics. Dr. Collins received his Bachelor of Science in Chemistry from the University of Virginia, a PhD in Physical Chemistry from Yale, and an MD with honors from the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. He then went on to spend nine years on the faculty at the University of Michigan, and then went to lead the H National Human Genome Research Institute in 1993. As, as all of you know, in 2009, Dr. Collins became the director of the National Institutes of Health, and he's uh, well known as a physician geneticist, especially noted for his landmark discoveries of disease genes and his leadership in the Human Genome Project. Among his many awards and accolades, he is an elected member of the Institute of Medicine, the National Academy of Sciences. In 2007, he was awarded the Presidential Medal of Freedom, and in 2009, he was awarded the National Medal of Science. It is truly my distinct honor and privilege to introduce Dr. Francis Collins. Thank you, Charles, for that very kind introduction. And it is an absolute delight for me to be able to be here at ASHG. I feel like you are my family. You're my professional connections going back for many years. I have attended this meeting for more years than uh, probably I can count. In fact, if this is the 60th anniversary, I've been here for more than half of those. And I'm glad to be here for this one. And to have the chance to speak to you here, even as people are uh, checking their airline tickets to make sure they can make it to the airport, I'm glad that all of you are here in this cavernous room uh, and happy to have the chance uh, to reflect a little bit on where things are from my new perspective as NIH director and how that might be relevant to what you all are doing uh, right there at the cutting edge of science as has been demonstrated so beautifully at this meeting. Genetics has, I think, emerged as the center of the center in terms of the powerful new approaches to understanding how life works and how disease sometimes occurs when things go awry. And I hope all of you have that sense of history in terms of what is possible right now, which even a few years ago would have almost been unthinkable. And this meeting, I guess, uh, very much demonstrated by the more than 6,000 registrants that have turned up, uh, has become one of the highlights uh, of the scientific year across all of biomedical research. So many thanks to the people who worked so hard uh, to organize this, particularly Charles, who led the program committee, and many others who put in a huge amount of time to put together such a remarkable program. And I hope you are all heading home uh, feeling energized, enlivened, inspired, and excited about the science that you're going to do uh, when you get back there. Whether it's basic or whether it's clinical, uh, whether you're looking at a mouse model or whether you're seeing patients trying to help sort out a complicated uh, medical genetic problem, uh, this is certainly a time uh, where the tools and the technologies and the insights uh, 
are growing at such a prodigious pace that one can't help but feel excited about how far we've come and where we may be able to go before, uh, then before even we gather again in, in a year. So in thinking about what to talk about to this group, I think the organizers hope to have a broader perspective. Uh, again, since we're here in Washington, uh, perhaps a perspective of what's happening in terms of not only science but science policy and how has uh, the current uh, set of developments uh, played out in a way that affect the field of genetics. So what you're in for over the next hour is my attempt uh, to try to put forward some of those concepts. First, I want to talk about health care reform because I think there continues to be a lot of confusion about exactly what is in this legislation, which is now the law of the land, and yet has been mischaracterized, uh, sometimes uh, in a benign way and sometimes intentionally, uh, in a way that I think has many people confused. Yeah, it's 2,700 pages, and I haven't read it all either. But there are aspects of this that I think are particularly important uh, for all of us involved in medical research, and especially those involved in clinical care, uh, to be familiar with. And I'm just going to walk through a few of those. And I also want to then move to how the health care reform legislation is particularly relevant to biomedical research because there are features of this bill that directly affect uh, translation and health care delivery. And then I'm going to go through some other challenges uh, for biomedical research. Some of them you could say are good challenges, some of them are a little worrisome, and walk you through this current st uh, setting and the stance uh, that we're trying to take uh, to achieve a good outcome. And in between all of this, I hope I'll be able to drop some science on you that you haven't already heard in the course of this amazing meeting. So let's start with health care reform. What is really in this bill? Many of you have, were engaged previously in a major effort uh, in the genetics policy arena to try to provide protection against genetic discrimination because we all recognize that if that protection was not provided, the opportunities for a greater use of genetics in standard of care of medical practice were going to be limited by people's understandable anxieties uh, about whether the information would get used against them. And I think all of us uh, at ASHG and with our uh, shared uh, enthusiasm for this amongst many other advocacy groups uh, celebrated when after some 12 years of back and forth uh, advances and retreats and disappointments and finally on May 21st uh, in this ceremony you see pictured here in the Oval Office, President Bush signed into law the Genetic Information Non-Discrimination Act and that was a great moment. But of course, that was not the entire answer for many of the families that we all interact with or take care of, because if you have a genetic disease that's already been diagnosed, uh, GINA does not provide protection against discrimination. Its protections were for predictive genetic information. And so despite the fact that many advocacy organizations like the Genetic Alliance were very much out in front uh, promoting the need for GINA, when the dust all settled, it became clear that not everybody uh, who had helped promote that were going to find the solution they hoped to have their child prevented from being discriminated against or having their genetic disease treated as a pre-existing condition. Healthcare reform has made a major advance in this regard. So the Healthcare Reform Act includes a number of features that are already in effect. It is a complicated scheme in terms of the timetable of when the various provisions are going to kick in, but already uh, people with new health plans can receive cost-free preventive services now in effect. Young adults can stay on parents' plan until age 26, and that's obviously important for families where young adults are in fact in some way disabled, and this gives a broader chance uh, for their coverage until a later age. Uh, choice of doctor, use of nearest ER, uh, also protected by the Affordable Care Act, and as well as these pre preventive care services, including smoking cessation. And importantly, as of now, insurers will no longer be able to put lifetime limits on benefits, which can be a huge deal uh, for individuals uh, who have genetic conditions that require a lot of care can't cancel a policy without proving fraud, can't deny claims without a chance for appeal, and maybe particularly important here, cannot deny coverage to children under 19 with pre-existing conditions. That has been a big problem for individuals who had a child with a genetic disorder 
uh, who may have been covered at birth because that was previously required, but if you were going to change jobs and seek new insurance coverage, that would have been called a pre-existing condition and you would have been in trouble. And so you were locked in, in many cases, uh, to an insurance coverage that may not have been ideal for you in other ways. So because of this, which is now in effect, as many as 72,000 uninsured children will be extended health care coverage and up to 90,000 will have certain benefits covered that weren't before. I think for this audience especially, as you're committed uh, to the care of kids uh, with genetic conditions, this is a very major event. If you want to learn more about what really is in the health care bill as opposed to what you might hear on cable news, uh, have a look at this website, healthcare.gov, and I think be prepared, certainly as people ask about this, to have at your fingertips the major features of the bill. This is also a bill which, despite what, again, has been spread about, is going to save money in the long run. The Congressional Budget Office, which has the responsibility in a nonpartisan, objective way of estimating what the consequences are of new legislation, uh, has estimated $100 billion savings over the next 10 years and over a trillion in the decade after that. Now, future provisions, which have not yet kicked in, but will be over the course of the next four years, you can see here involves a wide variety of other advantages uh, to uh, people who need this kind of care and this kind of protection against discrimination. Uh, the discrimination due to pre-existing conditions to extend beyond children does not appear until 2014, but it is part of the bill. So, I hope you have a sense of just what sweeping consequences this has for solving what has been clearly uh, for the United States an embarrassing situation of inadequacy and inequity in access to health care. The health care bill also has some very specific uh, components uh, that apply to biomedical research and I now want to turn to those. And in that regard, these actually intersect with a number of the themes that I have been trying to put forward as exceptional opportunities for NIH uh, in the last year. And those were summarized in a brief paper in Science Magazine back in January. In that article, which was based upon many conversations I had with big thinkers in the field, uh, and certainly including uh, people who are prominent in this society, uh, I came up with a series of five themes that seemed particularly ripe for large investments to be made one of them, the high throughput technologies, many of them coming from genomics, uh, need to be applied in an even more bold and comprehensive way. Another is to make sure that the basic science discoveries that are pouring out of laboratories get applied as rapidly as possible in a therapeutic direction. A third is to put science to work for the benefit of our new healthcare reform system, to let NIH become the source of the kind of evidence that we need in order to make wise decisions about healthcare. A fourth, to focus on global health with great opportunities and great interest there uh, with the opportunity for both infectious and non-infectious diseases to make substantial advances uh, for countries other than our own. And maybe most importantly of all these themes is to be sure that we are focusing on invigorating and empowering our most critical resource, which is all of you, the biomedical research community, and trying to make sure we're encouraging innovation diversity in our workforce, and a stable kind of career path for scientists so that they are not always worrying about the ups and downs of the enterprise. But I want to talk about two of these in more detail as they relate to the health care reform bill, one of them being translation and the other being health care reform. So I'm going to walk through some specific uh, events in that regard, starting with translation. So what am I talking about here? Uh, metaphorically, I'm talking about the very major challenge of taking advances in basic research, which I think have never been at a more exciting time, and moving across this gap here uh, to develop something clinically relevant. And in this example, it would be a small molecule therapeutic or a drug. And we all know that's pretty hard and it takes a long time. And maybe for many of you, the assumption has been that's not your job, that's the private sector's job. And of course, the private sector does focus intensively on this. And the goal here is to build a bridge, and you can now see which part of geography that was and what it looks like today. But is this solely the job of uh, pharmaceutical and biotech companies, or are we in fact at a point uh, where academic investigators funded by NIH could play a larger role? 
Most of us, I think, got into biomedical research, both because we thought it was fascinating and interesting and intellectually stimulating, but also because we hoped that something that we did would ultimately help somebody. And here is a chance, perhaps, to make that even a bit more real. Well, how does that work? If you're a basic scientist, what do you do to allow this uh, success to occur? And can we just count on pharma to keep up the effort to make it so and cheer them on? Well, there's a serious crisis underway in terms of the way in which this pipeline for drug discovery has been floundering. And if you look at this diagram, you can see what I mean. Pharma has been investing a larger and larger amount of money, that's billions of dollars there, now between 40 and 50 billion dollars a year, uh, which is certainly substantially more than NIH invests in all of biomedical research. And yet in spite of that, FDA approvals of new molecular entities, that is genuinely new drug therapeutics, not me too's, have been dropping steadily uh, over the last 15 years. The reasons for that are complicated, but certainly a lot of it is the need to be sure that you're approaching the right target when you're developing that therapeutic. And here is a place where NIH is very much involved, because if you're studying a particular disease and uncovering the molecular basis of that disease, whether you call it that or not, you're also identifying a potential drug target. So a lot of what NIH does, what you all do, uh, fits into this part of the early phases of drug development, even though it may not be thought of in that sense. Now suppose you've done that. Suppose you've uncovered a genetic cause of a rare disease, and you want to go forward to try to identify a therapeutic, uh, uh, a small molecule. What would you need to do next, and what resources are available to help you with that? Ten years ago, it was not so easy. In fact, most institutions were really not in a position to help you very much to start down this path. But that has all changed in major ways that I think have not still been fully realized uh, by many basic researchers. So I want to walk you through what this is and what resources are already there. The first thing you would probably want to do is to take your molecular uh, understanding of the disease and convert that into a cell-based or a cell-free assay, ideally something that could be done in, <coughs> excuse me, in a 1536 well plate, because you're going to want to take that assay now and screen it against hundreds of thousands of chemical compounds to see if somewhere in that library of shapes, which is basically what these are, there might be a few compounds that actually have the desired properties tested against your assay. So the assay might be a fluorescent signal, or it might even be a change in the cell uh, morphology, uh, something called a high content assay, where you're actually looking at something moving around between the nucleus and the cytoplasm. But it needs to be robust so that there's not a lot of noise in the system. This is all available uh, in terms of support for this, and in fact the screening itself is now available in four centers that NIH supports each of which has the capacity of a mid-sized pharmaceutical company as far as the ability to put assays through a shared library of about 350,000 compounds. And most of the assays that have gone through those centers in the last three or four years have resulted in hits. But that's not the end of the story. If you're really trying to move something towards therapeutics, usually your initial hits uh, are not what you exactly want. They're not as soluble or as potent or they may have other issues that make them unattractive, so some medicinal chemistry needs to kick in here to try to take that initial compound, figure out what its scaffold is, and try some modifications, adding a side chain or subtracting a side chain here and there to see whether you could optimize the compound to look a little better. All of these things are available through the NIH Molecular Libraries Initiative, part of the Common Fund, and more than 150 uh, lead compounds have come through this pipeline now over the course of the last four to five years, leading to publications, and virtually all of those turning out to be quite useful as research probes uh, for laboratory experiments. But more than half of them were originally uh, approached because of an interest in disease treatment and are now sort of poised to go to the next step. So what's the next step? I think people who have not been involved in this assume, okay, now you're ready to start a clinical trial. Well, not quite, because at this point you have insufficient information about whether this compound that you're excited about is actually going to be useful and safe uh, in a human trial. So you need to go on to the next step, which is sometimes called the preclinical phase.
or sometimes uh, somewhat cynically called the valley of death because this is where often projects go to die. And what do you need to do here? Well, you need, again, a lot of medicinal chemistry to do a lot of modifications of what you've started with and try to find a compound that hab absolutely has all the right properties as far as its absorption, its distribution, its metabolism, its excretion, and its lack of toxic effects on the traditional models for testing that. Now, we do have at NIH, especially in the last year or two, resources to enable a few projects to travel into this high-risk and high-expense space and yet I think they may not be widely known about. TREND, which stands for Therapeutics for Rare and Neglected Diseases, is one of those, and I'll tell you quite a bit more about it in a minute. RAID, which stands for Rapid Access to Interventional Development, also provides some of the resources to do this. So if you are able to take a compound through this phase and get the data that you think will be convincing to allow a clinical trial, then you go to the FDA. And that is, uh, if all goes well, the entry point to clinical trials, phase one, phase two, phase three. And ultimately, if all is approved, the FDA says, yes, it is now OK to have this uh, marketed uh, to patients with this condition. And of course, the clinical trial part of this is perhaps the most expensive. Traditionally, it's carried out by pharma and biotech. But for rare diseases where the market size may be so limited that pharma and biotech, even at this point, aren't interested in picking up a project, the NIH Clinical Center, with its 240 research beds, is actually in a very good position to conduct phase one and two trials. And we have now 55, and we'll soon have 60 of these CTSAs, the Clinical and Translational Science Awards, scattered all over the country, which are also very well set up to conduct these kinds of phase one and two trials for new molecular entities and are quite excited about that opportunity. You have to be selective, of course, because these are expensive and you need to be rigorous in deciding whether or not a particular approach is likely enough to succeed uh, to be able to make the investment because this pipeline, unfortunately, is a very low success rate. In pharma, only about 5% of projects make it from the left to the right. We actually think with targeting being now more and more driven by human discoveries, and many of them coming from GWAS, that we have a better chance of ending up with compounds that actually not only hit the target, but actually help the disease. One of the things that we need to do, though, is to be sure that the handoff between NIH and FDA uh, is more successful in this regard, because FDA has a very stringent set of requirements before a compound can be approved for human use or ultimately approved after clinical trials. Peggy Hamburg and I have been now working closely together uh, over the last year. We've set up a joint leadership council, which had its first meeting uh, just a little more than a week ago. We have funded together a regulatory science initiative to give FDA some of the science that they need in order to assess clinical trial designs that may be unusual such as for rare diseases, where maybe you can't find hundreds of patients or thousands of patients for a phase three trial, but you still want to know whether the drug is working or not. And this has been a very productive uh, start to a relationship. And with this leadership council, we are now assembling a list of high priorities of things that could be addressed between our two agencies. And rare diseases is very much a focus of many of those priorities. So let's talk about rare diseases. This is an audience that probably more than almost any other uh, scientific assembly uh, has an investment in trying to understand and ultimately develop interventions uh, for rare diseases. And we have a lot of work to do. There's some 7,000 diseases that affect humankind. And uh, some of those uh, are what you would call rare, that is, less than 200,000 diagnosed in the US. There are about 6,000 or more of these. Most of them, the majority, are in fact genetic conditions, single gene disorders, and less than 200 have any kind of drug therapy available. So look at those numbers. What about the other 5,800 and how are we going to get somewhere in terms of taking advantage of the fact that many of these are having their molecular basis uncovered, including quite a few presented for the first time at this meeting. There's another category of diseases that also needs attention, not because they're rare, but because they occur in low-income countries and not so much in the higher-income countries. And those are the neglected diseases, both infectious and non-infectious, that occur amongst impoverished and marginalized populations. And there again, 
having academic investigators play a larger role in developing therapeutics would be a good thing. So what's the idea here? The idea is to try to empower researchers, all of you and others that are supported by NIH, to play a larger role in moving therapeutics down that pipeline, not to try to replace what biotech and pharma do or to compete with them, but to de-risk projects that otherwise will lie untouched and to get them far enough down that pathway to become commercially attractive because a lot of the risk has been already taken on, at which point licensing them out for ultimate clinical trials and approvals makes a lot of sense. So let me tell you about Trend, because this is the new one on the, uh, the landscape at the moment that's already getting up and going, uh, article about it in the Wall Street Journal from last summer. But here is the idea. Uh, this is congressionally mandated. Uh, this has a budget of $24 million, which if we ever get a budget for FY11 is expected to grow to $50 million. It's a collaboration between intramural and extramural uh, projects enter at a variety of stages of development along that pipeline that I showed you. And again, the idea is to take, in, take the project just far enough for an external organization to want to adopt the clinical development and not to duplicate what pharma is already doing. Uh, what projects are underway? Well, only at the moment five that have been chosen as pilots. One of them is a neglected disease, schistosomiasis and hookworm. That is one where already a promising compound, a new molecular entity, uh, is in the early stage of lead optimization. The other four are rare diseases, Neiman Pick type C, hereditary inclusion body myopathy, sickle cell disease, and CLL. And you can see there are different kinds of approaches here in terms of compound types, repurposed approved drug here. So here's a case where you're trying to really shorten the process by picking a drug about which you already know a lot and seeing whether it would work in this new application. Let me tell you about the sickle cell disease example because that was, I think, informative and it's also timely. I don't know how many of you are aware that this is, in fact, the 100th anniversary to the month of the publication of this paper in 1910 uh, by James Herrick describing for the first time sickle cell anemia in a Jamaican medical student at the University of Chicago. And here we are a hundred years later with sickle cell disease having been the first molecular disease with its inheritance figured out uh, by Jim Neal and Linus Pauling playing a role in understanding what must be involved in the molecular basis and Vernon Ingram telling us that it was in fact a single amino acid change and yet we still are not in a position of saying that we've been able to take full advantage of all that information to come up with an effective therapeutic, although we have made some strides in that direction. In fact, I suspect many of you, like me, uh, when you talk about how human genetics is a great pathway uh, towards therapeutics for disease, have somebody say to you, well, okay, that's fine, but why haven't you cured sickle cell disease yet? Well, we should take that challenge, and I think the time has never been better to do so. There are a number of approaches now being uh, pursued for sickle cell disease. The GWAS studies have uncovered some very interesting opportunities for modifying levels of fetal hemoglobin, which may very well be targetable by small molecule drugs, and it's exciting to see that happen. Certainly the IPS cell approach to trying to come up with a way to correct the sickle mutation in an affected individual and create the opportunity to reinfuse uh, their own hematopoietic cells back into them by going through that step is also theoretically very attractive but obviously has many practical problems yet to be addressed. But Trend's project on sickle cell disease takes a different approach. So here the collaborator is a biotech and basically the compound is 5-hydroxymethyl-2-furfural, AES-103. And how does it work? Well, it binds to sickle hemoglobin selectively and increases its oxygen affinity. And how does that help? Well, if you get the dose just right, you are going to prevent uh, cells uh, from being irreversibly sickled uh, at low oxygen tension by allowing them to hold on to oxygen. Obviously, too much of this would be a bad thing, uh, but to get the dose just right, and you can see various curves over here uh, to try to tune that, could be a great advance. This is now in late preclinical and hopes to find its way into clinical trials in the next year or two as just one of these examples of how Trend is trying out something fairly bold 
for a disease that has not attracted much private sector investment because of its relative rarity, although it's not that rare a disease. So in this case, the compound didn't have to start all the way back here, although we've learned a lot about sickle cell disease over the years. The compound went straight to preclinical because it was a compound that it, something was already known about. And if you're more interested in what else Trend might be able to do, let me tell you that in fact this is now soliciting, this program is, new applications of this sort. Trend has the funding to push projects through the preclinical stage. If you know of such a project and want to be uh, involved in exploring it, here is how to do so. If you go to this website, trend.nih.gov, the deadline for the first cycle of this solicitation is December 6th. Uh, so you've got a little time, but not too much, uh, to put forward an application of this sort. And I think this ought to be of great interest uh, to this particular uh, group of scientists represented here today. Now, on top of trend, we have seen in the health care legislation, the Affordable Care Act, another arrival on the scene, uh, much stimulated uh, by the creative determination of Senator Arlen Specter a leader of the Senate who will be much missed after this current session ends. So Senator Specter also felt that we could benefit at this time in history by more investments and more creative opportunities for funding uh, to push projects along from basic discovery to therapeutic uh, success. And so as part of the Health Care Reform Act, there are these provisions uh, which are represented here basically giving NIH the opportunity uh, to put more effort into this in more flexible ways. Now the bill authorizes half a billion dollars uh, for FY10, uh, which has not happened because in NIH and every other government agency, authorizing is one thing. You can't do anything, however, until you have an appropriation. And FY10 uh, was way too late in the year for anything to be done about this Cures Acceleration Network or CAN. But for FY11, the House and the Senate, in their markups of the appropriations bills, have included $50 million to get CAN started. As you may know, we don't have an FY11 budget yet, even though we are more than a month into the fiscal year called uh, FY11. And that's fairly usual because the Congress almost never manages to get a full budget decision made by October 1st. So we're working on our continuing resolution, and especially now, after the election that occurred last Tuesday, it's hard to know exactly how the Congress is going to come to a conclusion about our budget. But we remain hopeful uh, that they will be able to do so, and that that will allow this Cures Acceleration Network to get started. Uh, it is aimed to reduce the barriers between lab discoveries and clinical trials. And it includes uh, various things like a review board of 24 members uh, to make sure that we invest the money wisely. And from our perspective, also some very useful features in terms of large grants that can be made and specifically this so-called DARPA-like authority, flexible research awards used by the DARPA agency for a whole host of innovative approaches that the Department of Defense is able to make. This gives us the chance to hire project managers to push projects along to make quick decisions about how f funds and resources need to be moved around in order to get the project to succeed, and also how to kill projects that are missing milestones and clearly are not going to make it. And you don't want to let those go on any longer uh, than necessary if it's clear uh, that things are not working. So we are looking forward, uh, even as we uh, somewhat uneasily uh, watch the timetable here, because starting a project of this magnitude halfway through the fiscal year uh, will be quite a challenge, and we hope we don't have to wait until February or March to find out uh, whether funds are actually going to be awarded uh, for this. But I hope you can see that this is yet another part of this complex pipeline, which is coming together pretty well and which I think is unprecedented in its power uh, to make it possible for NIH-funded researchers working all over this country and abroad uh, to be able to play a larger role in therapeutic development. The third opportunity on that list of five, and another one which was touched upon about healthcare reform, and so I wanted to put it in front of you, is this putting of science uh, to work for the benefit of healthcare. And that includes a focus on comparative effectiveness research, which is a term of art that hadn't really been heard about much until about two or three years ago, although actually NIH and many other organizations have been doing this kind of research for a very long time. 
The idea here is uh, to identify circumstances where there is more than one possible intervention available. It might be a diagnostic, it might be a therapeutic, and uh, compare them side by side to discover actually what works best. The uh, Affordable Care Act asked the Institute of Medicine to very rapidly survey the landscape and make recommendations about particular areas where such comparative effectiveness studies would be valuable across this range uh, of special kinds of areas of focus. They identified a hundred uh, of those opportunities. NIH at that time was already conducting research in 88 of those, uh, so we were happy to see that we already seemed to have the right ideas in terms of where the needs were and using dollars from the Recovery Act, uh, we're able to go after the other 12. So a lot going on here in terms of NIH support of this and probably involving quite a few of you here in this room. As an example uh, of this, uh, well, there's a uh, article that Mike Lauer and I wrote that uh, goes through what NIH's commitment has been. But perhaps one of the more famous examples of comparative effectiveness research uh, has been the application to diabetes carried out some time ago. The Diabetes Prevention Program I looked at 57 million Americans at high risk for developing type 2 diabetes. These are individuals who have impaired glucose tolerance and wondered what could we offer to those individuals to reduce their likelihood of going on uh, to full-blown type 2 diabetes. So the DPP trial enrolled 3,000 plus of these individuals with so-called pre-diabetes, uh, impaired glucose tolerance, and then offered them um, the chance to participate in a randomized trial uh, which randomized people to one of three arms. Uh, there was a metformin arm, and that in fact, as you can see from this diagram, did reduce uh, the risk of diabetes over a very modest intervention, which was simply to give a pamphlet or two and encourage people to practice healthy living. But the thing that worked best uh, was this coached lifestyle intervention where individuals with a lot of support uh, were encouraged to change their diet and to begin exercising 30 minutes a day, five times a week, and to actually lose five to seven percent of their body weight, which is actually quite achievable by many of the people in this group. And notice just how effective that was, substantially better than the other opportunities, reducing the risk by 58 percent. This is published now eight years ago. People have asked, well, well now wait a minute, isn't that kind of comparative effectiveness research actually colliding with personalized medicine? Because in the uh, simplest form, CER kind of puts a bunch of people into one approach and a bunch into another and doesn't pay too much attention about their personal differences. I think that is the kind of CER that we should be careful not to do because we really do want to understand uh, personal differences, and we can. And uh, basically, CER should be guided by this emerging science of genomics and personalized medicine so that you capture that data on genomics and on environmental exposure so that you could identify if there's a subset of individuals within a group that don't benefit or benefit exceptionally well, you would know that. So CER can generate such research hypotheses and NIH is well positioned to evaluate the comparative outcomes. This has already been done, in fact, in a retrospective way on the DPP. So if you saw a paper four years ago when TCF7L2 had been identified as the strongest uh, common variant that predisposes to type 2 diabetes, it was natural to ask the question, well, if you genotype people for that particular variant, does that make a difference in terms of how they responded to the three possible alternatives? And in fact, it's rather interesting to look at the data. Uh, here we have the TT homozygotes, who are the ones at highest risk uh, for type 2 diabetes. And sure enough, in the placebo treated, if you look over the course of four years, more of those go on to full-blown diabetes than do to the other genotypes. But interestingly, if you look at that lifestyle intervention, uh, the thing that seemed to be most effective of all the three arms, those TT homozygotes do just as well as do the other genotypes. So while they are at higher risk, they also achieve the same benefit from the intervention, which is an interesting observation, especially for people like me who know that we are TT homozygotes, and, and I am. <laughs> Uh, a further study uh, done more recently, just published uh, last month, has looked beyond TCF7L2 uh, to a long list of genes associated with diabetes risk, 
And uh, one of the findings there, and it makes a lot of sense, is that if you look at a variant in uh, the uh, gene called SLC47A1, you can see that the metformin-treated group actually do seem to have some relationship to genotype in terms of their response to that arm, as you can see in those bars. And in fact, well, that makes a certain amount of sense because SLC47A1 is the receptor for metformin. One of the ways that we hope to practice even more effective and widespread uh, CER, including personalized medicine interventions uh, and things such as pharmacogenomics, is by providing some infrastructure uh, for a pre-existing but somewhat loosely knit group called the HMO Research Network in order to turn them into what I like to call a collaboratory. These HMOs, all of which have electronic medical records, have in fact participated in a few studies done by individual NIH institutes and are now being put together in a more substantial way uh, to allow quick turnaround research questions to be posed that could only be answered if you have a large and fairly diverse group uh, of individuals being cared for. And this uh, systems together cover more than 13 million people. Uh, they can, in fact, then provide quick responses with the kind of infrastructure that is being supported uh, to questions such as rare uh, responses to new drugs that are now being commonly prescribed, uh, such as uh, interventions for prevention, do they actually work, uh, per personalized medicine, particularly in pharmacogenomics, very amenable to undertaking this, and even to look to see how can we modify provider incentives uh, to result in better outcomes and, and more value for the dollars that are being spent. So we're quite excited about having this collaboratory, supported by the Common Fund, uh, become a rapid response uh, effort uh, for a whole host of questions that are going to be informative for the future of healthcare. In addition, uh, another feature of the healthcare legislation that is of note uh, is the formation of an institute, a nonprofit corporation the Patient-Centered Outcomes Research Institute, which you may or may not have heard about, but which is going to be a pretty significant player going forward in these kinds of questions. Uh, the bill sets up in statute this 501c1 organization with a board of directors, members of which were announced uh, just uh, about six weeks ago, and I serve on that board, as does Karen on Clancy, the director of AHRQ. And there's also a methodology committee and it is charged to identify sort of in the way that the IOM did in a very quick turnaround fashion last year, but now this is going forward. What are the highest priorities uh, where comparative effectiveness research is needed? And that will certainly be a place where we will need to keep track of the personalized medicine implications. Uh, this uh, has a uh, whole host of consequences. The uh, Board of Directors is chaired by Gene Washington of UCLA. I can't tell you how many conference calls we've been on since September 23rd trying to stand this up when at the moment there is no staff, no office, and no way to figure out how to spend the money that's been allocated, but we remain hopeful that those things will become possible fairly soon, and this is certainly something uh, to keep an eye on, and the budget for this uh, will actually grow to almost half a billion dollars over the next five years, and so therefore will drive a lot of these kinds of comparative research projects. Let me go to the third of the three themes and talk about some current challenges for biomedical research that I think will be relevant uh, to this audience. First of all, and a very critical one, is this question of research support. Uh, this is a graph showing you what the uh, allocations, the appropriations have been for the National Institutes of Health starting back in 1998. The purple bars are the actual dollars that have been in those bills, and you will see, of course, the doubling that NIH enjoyed in that period between 98 and 2003, which is a period of great growth uh, for our field. That then was followed, as you also have probably noticed, uh, by a flat period of funding with very little growth between 2003-2008. In 2009-2010, the Recovery Act uh, came in and provided an extra $10 billion uh, for NIH research, which roughly was divided into two years and about $5 billion each, but had to be spent in 2009 and in 10. and therefore, in 2011, that allocation is no longer present. 
the President's budget for 2011, which is what the Congress has been deliberating about for several months, uh, gave an extra billion dollars to NIH, uh, bringing up the proposed President's budget to about $32 billion. And it was impressive indeed that at a time of such economic constraint uh, that this administration chose uh, to find money uh, to give an increase to the base of the National Institutes of Health. So that's all good news, and we should feel quite gratified at the way in which this reflects bipartisan support for what we do. What's not so good is the blue bars, which actually take these funds and calculate in what inflation has done to them as far as purchasing power. And in that regard, you can see that we've actually been losing ground uh, since 2003. And if you draw a line to where we are now, we're about the same place that we were uh, eight or nine years ago. Uh, and that is in the face of a great deal of growth in the biomedical research community, much of it stimulated uh, by this doubling that happened between 98 and 2003. And that, of course, puts stresses on our community and our ability to figure out how to keep the great science going because this means that we don't have the resources that we wish we did to support all of the applications that come into NIH. That success rate graph shown here uh, documents sort of the consequences of what has been going on over this timetable, in fact, even going further back to 1979. And you can see that for most of the last 40 years, uh, if you sent a grant, or 30 years, if you sent a grant into NIH, uh, your chance of getting funded was somewhere in the neighborhood of 30 percent. But beginning with that flattening of the budget in 2003, and with an increase in the denominator, because more and more grants were coming in, you can see success rates falling off now down to about 20 percent in 2010. And of course, we don't know what they will be in 2011. Uh, because we don't know what the budget will be. And there are certainly concerns, especially with some of the rhetoric you've heard since Tuesday, that there might be a desire to roll back the federal budget for everything discretionary, which includes NIH, uh, to FY08 levels. Uh, that would, of course, cause this diagram to drop uh, profoundly, uh, perhaps down a, as low as 10 percent. Uh, this is, of course, a source of great stress on all of you and on all of us at NIH trying to figure out how best to handle things. And there are a number of things that we are doing uh, to try to be sure that science continues to go forward and that innovation is encouraged and that investigators who are early in their careers are especially given a chance uh, to be supported. For instance, if you're a first-time investigator to NIH with your grant, you are not put in the same pool as the experienced investigators uh, when the decisions are made about funding. You're competing against other early-stage investigators, and the experienced investigators are competing against each other. And we think that has been a big help in terms of making it possible for newly uh, arriving investigators to NIH to get a fair shake, even if they don't have a long track record and quite as much preliminary data. There are other things we're trying to do uh, to try to encourage new thinking. Just a month ago, I announced this project or program, uh, you may have read about it in Nature, called the Early Independence Awards. These are not for everybody, but we are looking into the possibility of funding occasional PhDs or MDs or MD-PhDs who are allowed to develop an independent program without going through a, many years of postdoctoral training. A few institutions have had pilot projects of this sort, and now the NIH is going to try a pilot as well. And if you want to read more about that, you can go to our website. The applications are due in December. A successful applicants would have to identify an institution that's also willing to provide them with space and administrative support. Uh, and mentoring so that they're not being thrown out there without that kind of encouragement. But it would be up to the investigator, uh, the, the early independence award investigator, to design their own research program and to take responsibility for pushing it forward. This is one of uh, several efforts we're making to try to deal with the increasing age at which investigators receive their first NIH award, which now stands at 42, uh, which in the view of almost all of us is much later than it should have to be. Uh, we are encouraging other kinds of funding mechanisms uh, that promote innovation. We've changed our peer review around to substantially to try to make sure that this is considered one of the highest criteria for success. And we have special grant awards like the New Innovators and the Transformative R01s and the Pioneer Awards that are specifically intended for applicants who may not have a lot of preliminary data but have an idea which, if it's successful, could be groundbreaking.
One of the areas, though, that I think we do now have to look at more significantly than we have had uh, to do in the past is whether our workforce uh, for biomedical research is, in fact, properly planned for. I don't think it's fair to expect that NIH is going to go through another doubling anytime soon. In fact, given the current fiscal constraints and the struggling economy, I think if we could keep up with inflation, we would consider that to be a pretty successful outcome. And yet, we have never really tried to model what the workforce should look like in such a stable environment. How many trainees should be brought through and how should they be trained? And how many research projects per faculty member is sensible? Uh, Bruce Alberts, in a fairly uh, bold editorial in September, has also raised the question about whether it is, in fact, a good idea for the stability of the long-term research enterprise for institutions to demand that their faculty members have their salary supported uh, to a very high degree, in some instances 90 or 100 percent. Because a great deal of NIH funds are currently going into that support, not only to support the salary, but the indirect costs on top of the salary. And one might make the case, and in fact, I think there is a broader willingness than ever to actually talk about this, that it would be better for those funds, perhaps, uh, to be available for other investigators and have, instead of having so much of this tied up in salaries and indirects. Uh, we at NIH are beginning to look at this uh, in a careful way. My advisory committee to the director uh, is being charged to take a role here. And we're going to have a big discussion about this at the NIH Institute Director's Leadership Forum coming up in about three weeks. No changes will be possible in a very rapid turnaround time because this is obviously a critical issue for many institutions who depend upon this support. But in the long term, I think we have to ask hard questions about whether this particular part of our funding plan is the best way to maintain the health of the enterprise. So coming near to the end here, let me also mention a couple of other challenges to biomedical research uh, that have occupied the attention of several of us. Uh, a, a rather surprising outcome uh, was, in fact, uh, the uh, issuance of a preliminary injunction by Judge Royce Lamberth on August 23rd based upon a suit filed uh, by uh, two investigators who are particularly working in adult stem cell research arguing that human embryonic stem cell research was doing damage to their research efforts by competing for the same dollars. Judge Lamberth looked at the evidence and actually focused more on the language of the Dickey Wicker Amendment, which is the way in which Congress has limited uh, but also allowed uh, federal funds for human embryonic stem cell research. Dickey Wicker has been around now for 14 years, has been interpreted by three administrations to disallow the generation of new human embryonic stem cell lines uh, with federal funds, but to allow the use of those lines uh, once they had been determined uh, according to appropriate guidelines most recently put forward by NIH uh, in concert with the Obama administration's executive order. But the judge basically said this was not consistent with his reading of the congressional language. Uh, that halted uh, continuations of funds for grants, uh, intramural research, uh, funding for some new applications, review of new lines to add to the registry, now standing at 75 lines, and even peer review of new proposals, and created a great deal of upheaval, uncertainty, and angst there at the end of August. Uh, the Department of Justice, uh, consulting with NIH, uh, stepped in uh, quite vigorously and uh, challenged this and asked the Court of Appeals to step in. And on September 9th, the Court of Appeals did so and issued a temporary stay, which allowed NIH to resume our activities. There was a very interesting hearing in front of Senator Harkin on uh, September 16th, where the people you see here testified including uh, very impressive uh, comments, uh, particularly from George Daly and Sean Morrison. Uh, the Court of Appeals uh, issued uh, a permanent stay on September 28th, but of course that's a permanent stay of the preliminary injunction, so this isn't over yet. Uh, the government has now subsequently filed support uh, for a uh, request that the original uh, decision by Judge Lamberth uh, be decided the other way as a summary judgment. All documents have been submitted, and the decision uh, by Judge Lamberth in the district court may occur at any time. 
The appeals court is still active and has scheduled oral arguments. This is, I understand, a very complicated set of legal maneuvers, but I think the bottom line is to say that we are not at all clear what the status is at this point of human embryonic stem cell research. And for a field that has so much promise and has recruited a whole host of talented scientists, many of them early in their careers, uh, to be now subjected to this kind of uncertainty is truly unfortunate. And we are doing everything we can uh, to try to put this back on a firm footing. Uh, finally, going more to genetics and the challenges that face us, here is a really good thing that you've heard about at this meeting, I'm sure, many times, the fact that the sequencing costs uh, for DNA have been dropping at a prodigious rate, more rapidly than Moore's Law, and that has made it possible, of course, to have whole genomes and whole exomes uh, pouring out of laboratories uh, across the world. That has also made many new discoveries come to pass as far as genetic basis of disease and has resulted, therefore, in the number of gene tests that are available uh, growing even more rapidly than in the past, as you can see from this particular diagram, which comes from the gene test database. But of course, this has also heightened the concern about whether oversight of this kind of test is appropriately in place with the advent of direct-to-consumer testing by companies such as the ones you see here and concerns expressed by the Congress about this, more and more people have been asking whether oversight is adequate. Genetic testing oversight, of course, occurs in two different ways, by the Clinical Laboratory Improvements Amendments, the CLIA certification, which looks primarily at analytical validity, and by the FDA, considering whether clinical validity and clinical utility might be in place. And as you know, genetic test kits have to satisfy review by both of those organizations, whereas laboratory-developed tests are subjected to CLIA certification, but not at the present time uh, to FDA oversight. And most genetic tests are laboratory-developed in part because uh, this is an easier way to bring something to market. The Congress has gotten quite concerned about this, uh, launched an investigation, uh, as you can see in this uh, particular report from the Washington Post, and inspired by that and other things, the FDA has now sent letters uh, to companies uh, asking uh, for more information about the way in which they are doing direct-to-consumer marketing. And Peggy Hamburg and I wrote a brief article in New, New England Journal about how NIH and FDA are going to try to work together in this regard, uh, and it's particularly to better define the regulatory pathways for coordinated approval of co-developed diagnostics and therapeutics, and to make accurate information about tests available, and to develop a risk-based approach for approval of diagnostics, which has not necessarily been the case in the past. So, as part of that, and something that I think many of you have been involved as commenting upon, NIH is now building a voluntary genetic testing registry, uh, which will include all of the information that currently resides within gene tests, but adds a host of other information to it and makes it more easily searchable because of the structure of the database. There was a meeting about this uh, just on Tuesday uh, here at the Convention Center, lots of good input from those who attended. And we continue to seek broad public input on the design of this registry, which we hope will be a real valuable resource uh, for all of you, as well as for some motivated patients who want to find information there as well. But the primary target of this database is intended to be the practitioner. Finally, before I stop, as another interesting area of policy developments, I don't know whether you have followed what has recently been happening in terms of the discussions about intellectual property and DNA sequence information. Uh, this piece in Science Insider uh, from just a few days ago uh, summarizes this, but basically this began with a lawsuit filed by the ACLU, and as you can see from this page here, a number of other plaintiffs, including distinguished members of this society, who filed a lawsuit against Myriad and the PTO, uh, claiming that the BRCA1 and 2 patents are invalid and unconstitutional. Uh, I think to the surprise of many people, the federal district court and Judge Robert Sweet actually ruled in favor of the plaintiffs and against the defendants and stated that isolated DNA is a product of nature and therefore is not patentable, which is certainly not consistent with what the PTO has been doing uh, for a long time. And you can read the quote here in terms of what the judge had to say in that decision. Now, as you might imagine, that was immediately the source of an appeal uh, from Myriad uh, to seek uh, a relief from this. And what's happened since then uh, that appeal filed June 16th, 
uh, is that the Court of Appeals is considering the case, and the Department of Justice of the U.S. government was asked uh, to consider filing an amicus brief. Uh, we had the chance to work with the DOJ and provided expertise about the science, although this is clearly a policy issue uh, for DOJ to consider. And ultimately, the DOJ put forward two questions, whether human-engineered DNA molecules, such as cDNAs or siRNAs, or things that were created with human ingenuity, uh, gene therapy vectors, for instance, are patent-eligible subject matter. The DOJ's opinion was yes. But are isolated but otherwise unmodified genomic DNA sequences patent eligible as subject matter, the DOJ concludes no. Uh, that is a very important distinction in terms of its consequences, particularly for the advent of whole genome sequencing as part of personalized medicine, because whole genome sequencing presumably looks at DNA in its natural state and might therefore be possible to do without being seen as violating any of the patents that are currently issued on thousands of human genes, and that might make this whole process much more feasible at an affordable cost. A quote from the DOJ's uh, particular dis, uh, amicus brief here, the BRCA genes, their deleterious alleles, and their relationship to breast cancer are the products of evolution, not human invention. So, I hope I've given you a, a bit of a sense of the very large number of issues uh, that are currently facing biomedical research and where we have the opportunity, if we work together, uh, to move the ball forward in a way that will benefit science and, most importantly, benefit patients. But we need more than ever uh, to have our voices heard in the often contentious debates about many of these issues. And so, my final point is to exhort all of you uh, to take every opportunity to explain what you do scientifically uh, to those who may not understand it, uh, to justify why this is such an exciting time for research and the promise that it holds, and why medical research is, of all the investments that the government makes, uh, perhaps one of the best and the one that ought to be least subject uh, to partisan bickering. So talk to policymakers. Invite your elected representatives to come to your university and to meet students and talk to them in the bench or go to a, a patient's bedside where a new therapeutic trial is being conducted to make this real. That's the single most important thing I think we do to explain ourselves uh, to legislators is to give them a chance to see what really goes on. And they are usually quite excited by the compelling stories they hear. Reach out to the media in every way that you have the chance to do, not to hype up what genetics can do, but to explain it in ways that is going to excite those who hear about it, because it is exciting, even if it means, you know, putting on sunglasses and playing guitar with Joe Perry, the lead guitarist uh, of uh, Aerosmith. Do what you can uh, to try to uh, make the case that science is not only exciting, it's even cool. Uh, uh, put, put on efforts for students uh, to try to encourage passion for science in the next generation through things like DNA Day and ASHG is very engaged in these efforts. Uh, meet with students every chance you get. Reassure them that even though we are in a circumstance right now where there are anxieties about the support for biomedical research, we've been there before, we have these ups and downs, we will survive nicely, and it's still the best possible kind of place to be. If you're interested in science and improving the human condition, biomedical research right now is probably the most compelling opportunity that could be imagined. And certainly, as you see things happening that you think NIH uh, could pay attention to uh, usefully, do not be shy uh, to let us know. My email address is easy to find on the web, and lots of you have found it, and that's good. And I'm always happy to hear constructive suggestions, uh, as well as uh, points uh, in a gentle way, if you think NIH is on the wrong path, because we are very much, after all, uh, here to serve you. Once again, let me say what a pleasure and a privilege it is to be able to talk to this audience, to be here amongst my own peeps, and to have a chance uh, to share with you some of these thoughts. Thank you very much. Thank you again, Dr. Collins, for a wonderful talk. Um, Dr. Collins actually has a, a question and answer session with the press. Uh, in a few minutes, but he's agreed to take a few questions if um, there's any pressing questions in the audience. 
And there are microphones in these two aisles, if you haven't already identified them. So please, if you would, uh, head to a microphone and identify yourself. I see a lot of people heading not to the microphone, but to the airport. And I understand that as well, <laughs> recognizing we are somewhat at the end of the meeting. We'll wait one more second and then see if anyone wishes to come forward. Ah, I see someone coming down the aisle with arm raised. That's a sign of some sort. Yes. Um, I'm Lois Tully from NIH. My question is almost more from a lay perspective. Um, when you hear politicians saying they want to repeal health care uh, reform, what I hear often is uh, tort reform and um, buying health care across state lines. I'm not even sure exactly what that means. But do you hear more, uh, you know, from issues from more of a scientific perspective when you hear uh, why people are so intent on repealing health care reform? No, I don't think uh, at least the, the voices I've heard being raised against the health care reform bill have targeted the scientific components at all. Uh, and again, I think we should all consider ourselves very fortunate that science and biomedical research uh, do not seem to have arrived at the point of becoming partisan uh, reasons uh, for bickering. I think the concerns about health care reform go much more to the other broader provisions and particularly for the requirement for people to become covered and penalties if you uh, choose not to, which some people are objecting to as uh, getting in the way of personal decision making. But frankly, right now the rhetoric uh, is so heated that it's often hard to figure out whether the speaker is actually aware or concerned about individual details or just mad about the whole thing. There's a lot of that going on, too. Yes. Kajan van Ommen, Netherlands. Francis, a question uh, on this patenting issue that I have been grappling with and many people in our field is actually this sort of balance between protecting IP for therapeutic development and allowing uh, similar things for diagnostic uh, to go free because we increasingly when we have to go into development of actual interventions we have to protect what we're doing otherwise the, uh, the, the people who are developing it are not interested in what we come up with mm -hmm. whereas on the other hand to get free diagnostics it would be quite valuable to have it low. Is there some sort of dimension in that to try to educate that they shouldn't make this sort of slicing and dicing on language on in the body or outside of the body but just make a bit more of a, a purpose oriented type of, of definition. So I'm not a lawyer and I won't be able probably to give a really nuanced response. I think the con discussion that's going on right, right now sort of relates to what is considered patentable matter and what is not. Uh, going back a bit, though, I would say NIH has been very engaged in the issue that you talked about in terms of once a patent is granted, should it be licensed in an exclusive way, which makes sense for a therapeutic where you're going to have a long pathway with a great deal of expense before you can bring something to market, or should it be licensed non-exclusively, which is NIH's position when it comes to diagnostics where competition would generally be a good thing and the cost of developing the test is considered to be, while not zero, certainly nothing like the cost of making a drug, for instance. I think, though, the current discussion is whether DNA sequence in its natural state should be patented for any purpose. And that would, of course, if you say no, that would also say it shouldn't be patented for therapeutic purposes. And maybe your question raises a concern about whether that is missing opportunities for investment. I think that you could have a serious conversation, though, about whether the composition of matter patents on DNA sequence are really necessary to inspire therapeutic development. Because what's going to be valuable, ultimately, down that long therapeutic pipeline is not the gene sequence, but it's going to be the actual therapeutic, a biologic, perhaps, or a small molecule. There, for sure, IP becomes critical. But have we, in the last 20 years, um, without thinking as hard as we might have,
allowed patenting to occur too early in that pipeline, in the pre-competitive space, and in the process actually discouraged uh, some applications that might by now have happened. There are certainly people who believe that that is a problem. Hence the DOJ is looking carefully at this, although I will say they are lawyers. They're looking at this in the context of what the patent law was supposed to cover in uh, Section 101 about patentable material, and their sense is if it's in its natural state, if we all have it, that doesn't sound like a substance that patents were ever intended uh, to cover. Yes, two more questions and then we'll stop. It was an yeah. inspiring talk, thank you. Talking about the rare diseases, uh, I think we all agree that it should be a combined effort of scientists from the States, but also from other continents in Europe and Japan. Uh, could you comment on the recent developments? I think there's a contract between the European Commission and the Seventh Framework Program and the NIH that uh, we could apply together for certain grants. Um, I'm not sure that particular uh, example is what I know enough about, but certainly as somebody who's been talking a lot uh, to the EU and to Ruxandra uh, Draghi Akli about ways to work more closely together, there was, for instance, a recent meeting in Iceland on rare diseases uh, sponsored by NIH and the EU, uh, which was quite exciting in terms of the potential there for additional working together. In about a month, the heads of international research organizations, which includes NIH and the MRC from the UK and the Wellcome Trust and the EU, uh, China, uh, Japan, Australia, uh, will be meeting at NIH to talk about additional ways that we can do these things together at a time of considerable economic constraint. So yeah, we are exploring mechanisms to do that. I spent uh, a week in China just two weeks ago and had very good discussions with the Chinese scientific agencies about ways that we can work together in fashions that would build on the strengths of both because China is becoming quite a powerhouse, especially in genomics, as you may know. Last question. Um, oh, that was a brilliant talk, I thought. Thank you very much. Um, I'm a grad student in Oxford at the moment. and. Uh, I guess I got interested in human genetics ever since the Human Genome Project and so on. Um, I was just wondering if you thought um, human genetics has promised too much too early. Every now and then we come across uh, articles which write something of the sort of scientists have cracked open the genetic architecture of type 2 diabetes and so on. As far as I understand that is not quite true. Do you think scientists as a community could do something to prevent journalists from promising so much when that's not actually true? And do you think that's going to hurt our, you know, do you think this phenomenon is going to hurt our chances of getting more funding over the next five, ten years as taxpayers get more and more frustrated? Because, you know, it's going to take us a bit of time. That's a great question. Uh, it depends on who's doing the promising, I suppose. Uh, certainly, scientists, I have just argued, uh, ought to be putting themselves forward as domain experts about what they do and talking to the press uh, when some development has happened to explain it, uh, what it means and what it doesn't mean. Uh, we as scientists sometimes get a little carried away uh, by our own excitement about what we've learned that maybe we've struggled for years to discover and we perhaps at times may overstate its significance. But even if the scientist does a pretty good job of giving a balanced view, uh, reporters are under great pressure from their editors so that if something is good, it's got to be fabulous. And if something is bad, it's got to be really awful. And so that factor of exaggeration creeps in, especially when the headline gets written. And we've seen that over and over again. And there's not a lot that one can do other than trying to continue uh, to speak uh, the sort of balanced truth of what's happened. We at NIH are particularly now trying to do everything we can to provide resources for reporters when they're not on deadline uh, to get sort of the kind of basic background information to prepare, especially in an area that's growing rapidly in its implications, so that everybody has got a good grasp of what's promised and what probably won't happen right away. I have to say I was personally distressed uh, this summer by the flurry of articles uh, led particularly by Nick Wade in the New York Times that said, okay, 10 years after the human genome, it hasn't added up to much, uh, in, in a very cynical kind of way. After reading Nick's article, I sat down in the space of 10 minutes and wrote down 29 clinical applications that have happened as a consequence of the Genome Project that are real in their effects on real people, many of them for rare diseases. But it's not as if this has been an un-
successful decade. It's true, however, that most people's lives haven't been touched uh, by the human genome sequencing. In research, I think we'd all agree, it's almost impossible to imagine how we did anything before we had access uh, in a free databases uh, to these, this information about our own instruction book. So I, I'm giving you a long answer because it's not an easy one to sort of hit the sweet spot, but we should try. We should try to both convey the excitement and not be ashamed of our passion about it if we feel that, but also to balance that with just how tough the road can be uh, to go from an insight to something that's actually going to benefit somebody in medical practice. And that is a long and expensive and failure prone road, but it's the best hope we have. And I don't think we should be shy to describe how this affects our hopes for the future uh, for all those people who need that hope because right now they don't have what they need. Thank you all very much. So this will conclude the 60th annual meeting for the ASHG. I want to thank you very much for all of your participation. And we hope you enjoyed the meeting and look forward to seeing you in Montreal next year. Safe travels home. <laughs>